If I can quote one of my favorite anarchists, Emile Armand, he said, I'm convinced there's room on this planet for every blossom in the libertarian rainbow. I would add a caveat that on the condition that there's no exploitation of others, sort of Benjamin Tucker's law of equal liberty, any type of economy that people want to try, I say let them try it. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, as well as links to our YouTube, Stitcher, and SoundCloud accounts, visit our website at nonservium.medium. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. We appreciate all donations, big or small, and your support helps us keep this project going. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 20th episode of the show. If you've spent any time in anarchist spaces, it may appear that there's little common ground between anarchists of different tendencies. While I must admit I have benefited greatly from observing debates between different types of anarchists, I also recognize that sometimes our differences aren't as dramatic as we think they are. Today I'll be chatting with an anarchist communist, and while we may have different approaches towards some things, our interests and goals overlap in a variety of important ways that make me feel optimistic about a society that allows for all sorts of voluntary experimentation to take place. An anarchy without adjectives. Here's my interview with a thoughtful guy who goes by the name of Maddie. Maddie is an anarchist from West Virginia who has written about Max Stirner, Appalachian religion and its relationship to class struggle, folk music, Japanese egoist anarchism, and more. He's also a member of Wither Appalachia's editorial committee, which is a journal and blog dedicated to critical analysis and a radical understanding of Appalachia and its future. Maddie, welcome to the show. Glad to be on. So one of the reasons I started following you, Maddie, is because our interests aligned in a few different ways. And it was clear to me that you knew your stuff when it came to religion, which is fun and interesting. I used to nerd out over similar topics back in the day. And also, you just have some very authentic and unique takes when it comes to music and anarchism. And I was thinking that even though our political tendencies diverge in a lot of ways, I'm confident that they intersect in a lot of interesting ways also. And I figured it'd be cool to explore some of those ideas with you a little more. Well, thanks for uh, starting us off in such a complimentary way. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. And uh, no, I pretty much agree with what you just said. I'm sure while we no doubt have a lot of differences, which I'm also excited to talk about, I'm looking forward to seeing where we can at least overlap a little bit. For sure. So you're in Appalachia. What's the anarchist scene like there? Well, Appalachia is a a big place, so uh, I think it might be best if we started talking about the anarchist scenes rather than the anarchist scene, because uh, I have no idea what's going on in, you know, say, Kentucky, for instance. But uh, here in Morgantown, it's not as strong as it was a couple of years ago. Right after the Trump election, I think a lot of people decided to sort of dip their toes in the radical water, and then a lot of them sadly didn't (laughs) didn't take the plunge. So it seemed like right after the election, a lot of people that I'd never really talked about politics before with, they started sending me messages on Facebook, on Twitter, coming up to me in person. And they're like, well, you know, Matt, I used to kind of disagree with you. Now I agree with you. We should sort of tear the whole thing down and start over, which isn't actually, it's not 100% accurate to my position, <laughs> but, I <understood. laughs> right. but I understood what they were saying. Yeah, they're there spiritually with you, at least it seems. Yeah, exactly. When I was in college, I was part of the, uh, the left alliance at WVU. That had a lot of anarchists in it. Then we had the Morgantown Ultra Left Network, which leaned very heavily anarchist or at least libertarian communist. And now those people have moved away or graduated, so there are still a lot of anarchists in town, not as many as I would like there to be. And I'm in close contact with a lot of people in Pittsburgh. They're anarchists seen there. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I recently moved from Austin to San Antonio, and 
Uh, San Antonio's got a pretty small scene. I mean, almost non-existent, I'd say. it's This is like a big military town, big conservative town. And I mean, I'm sure growing up in not a, the same exact culture, but I mean, I would imagine the culture would be similar in some ways. How has growing up in Appalachia shaped your political convictions? Well, that's a really good question, because the thing that really first got me into thinking about any kind of serious politics was a uh, mountaintop removal. Well, just in case anybody doesn't know, you know, that's uh, it's right in the name there. They blow the top off the mountain so they can mine coal. And uh, what they do with the rest of it, they, it's called a valley fill. They basically, when they're done blowing the top off the mountain, they push it into the nearest valley and fill up the land there. And so that was a really big issue around the time I was, I mean, it's still a big issue, but that was a really big issue around the time I was 12 or 13. And just seeing that kind of ecological devastation, though I wouldn't have used that word then because I didn't know it, it really got me to think a little bit more critically about politics, about capitalism, about the environment, stuff like that. And of course, the whole history of Appalachia. Growing up, you know, you hear a lot about the Cold Wars, you hear about things like the Maitwan Massacre, you hear about the Battle of Blair Mountain. Mm -hmm. And even aside from that, you know, aside from the more violent aspects of Appalachian labor history, you're still told about things like company towns, company script and stuff like that. And so I think any Appalachian person who is a little bit familiar with their background isn't going to have a hard time seeing exactly how exploitative capitalism is, or at least can be. Yeah, for sure. So listeners of the show may have heard us discuss free market communism in past episodes, and I'm sure most are familiar with standard anarchist communism too. But I was wondering if you could explain what communism means to you. I'll try. So there are a lot of definitions of communism. There are people who will use the classic Marxist definition. We, we call communism the real movement that abolishes the present state of things, which is all right as far as it goes, but I think it's a little vague. To me, communism, in the simplest terms that I can really talk about it, is a classless, stateless society or economy, whatever word you want to use, based on the principle from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. Okay. And um, a lot of people, just your, your average normal person, I guess, hears the word communism and um, sort of freaks out. They might associate it with states, with um, draconian laws and, and tyranny and the USSR and different things like that. But you obviously are an anarchist communist. Yes. So can you spell out the difference between the fears that people have of what communism is and your anarchist communist take? Well, yeah, it's caused me a lot of trouble because it's like you said, a lot of people hear that word and they get spooked. And I don't blame people for associating that with the USSR or you know China or even North Korea because there are a lot of people who call themselves communists today who still associate themselves with that. I wish they wouldn't, but uh, they do. And there's very little I can do about that. So that's why I use the mouthful anarchist communist. I would love to either just call myself an anarchist or call myself a communist. But when you get into these fine distinctions, it's not always as easy as I would like it to be to use a short label. And so if anybody wants to actually have the discussion, I'll try to talk to them, uh, you know, because Russia does come up. The USSR comes up a lot. And they'll say, well, you know, this happened, that happened. I guess you're I guess you love Stalin, huh, Maddie? And I'm like, well, no, I don't. Uh, <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, there was never really any communism in Russia. And then I try to explain, you know, let's look at the definition of communism. By communism's own terms, did the USSR fulfill that objective? And I think if you think about it carefully and if you walk them through it, they'll have to admit that it didn't. Most people will. Again, tankies are a whole other category. We're not talking about that yet. <laughs> yeah. But, um... You know, I tell them I'm for, you know, I'm for voluntary associations. I'm for free communism, or you can say libertarian socialism. But a lot of people associate libertarianism with the Libertarian Party. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no matter what words you choose to use, you're going to be damned one way or another. Right. <laughs> words trap us in so many ways. They're insufficient. Exactly. An interesting thing about you also is it seems that you've been influenced by sort of post-left thought. One obvious association that people normally make with communism is they associate it with leftism. Uh, but you seem to be somewhat critical to the left. So what's wrong with the left? And how, how can you separate that from communism? The first thing that I think is wrong with the left is that it's a very, very vague term. 
and I suppose you could say that communism and anarchism are too, but not in the same way. Because if you watch the news, people talk about people like Nancy Pelosi as, as if she's a radical leftist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or something like that. And any political category that can run the gamut from Stalin to Nancy Pelosi is not a very useful one, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> but <laughs> to be a little more serious about it, I, I think that leftism is really much more a series of capitalist managerial strategies, different ways to manage capital itself rather than an ideology or a political theory that's actually concerned with social change. Yeah. So some people have said this about Marxism. Some people say that it's a it's a theory of capitalism. Yeah. Sort of bound by it. No, I was just reading something about this the other day. I wish I could remember what it was. But no, I agree with you. I mean, obviously, Marx wrote the book on capitalism and, and not to unfairly demonize Marxists or Marx himself, but I think that's one of the ways that Marxism can tend to such an authoritarian direction because Marx said quite a lot about capitalism but said almost nothing at all about what communism might or should look like. It's there if you want to go through his works. You can find the scattered statements here and there, but Marx was much more concerned about an analysis of how capitalism works than what communism would look like or how communism would work, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but a lot of people have taken advantage of that. Who do you think would be a good example of someone who articulates what a positive vision of communism might be? Uh, maybe someone like Kropotkin mm -hmm. in The Conquest of Bread or Fields, Factories, and Workshops. Though I'm also critical of anybody who lays out a blueprint that's too detailed, but that's a separate question. I think people like Kropotkin, people like uh, William Morris, the great English utopian who wrote News from Nowhere, he did an excellent job of laying out what he thought, what he hoped communism would look like anyway. Yeah, so uh, as you said earlier, lots of tankies do stand for these authoritarian regimes. Why are there so many tankies? And what do we do with them? <laughs> well, I'm not sure if I can say what I'd like to do with them on a podcast. But, uh, <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm going to be good. <laughs> I think, really, the most basic reason why there are so many is the, uh, the apparent success of the USSR, the apparent success of China, the apparent success of all the old Soviet satellite regimes. You know, because if you talk to a tanky, as I often have, much to my consternation, eventually they will say, it's almost guaranteed to come up, they'll say, well, Marxism, Marxist-Leninism is the only revolutionary politics that has been successful. And am I allowed to swear? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I'm in a bad mood, my reply will be something like, fuck off. But uh, <laughs> if I'm in a more charitable mood, I'll say, okay, well, what do you mean by successful? Because, you know, the USSR was definitely uh, successful at creating a new class system. You know, it was definitely successful at slaughtering millions of proletarians, but uh, wasn't so successful at creating a classless, moneyless society. Right. But, um, yeah, I think that's probably the reason why, because, you know, there hasn't... <laughs> People have actually said this to me before. They're, they say things like, name one successful anarchist state. And I'm like, well, you've got me. I can't name a successful anarchist state. <laughs> and I, I'm not trying to straw man here. I'm just... Yeah, it's just a silly, like, obvious misunderstanding of what it is that we're talking about, which is frustrating. Right, exactly. I think that's a large part of it. You can't discount that up until relatively recently, you know, all of the communist parties, all of the mainstream communist parties were... Stalinist or, you know, some of them might have been Maoist, but they're all connected to these authoritarian regimes. And so I can't really blame people if that's their idea of what communism is, because so much has been done to further that idea, both by people who are ostensibly pro-communist and by people who are anti-communists. Right, right. So you do find affinity with communism in some way, obviously. I'm sort of more of the mutualist or, or market anarchist oriented type. Uh, why communism instead of other tendencies within anarchism? You know, there are a lot of different ways you can answer that question. Because in some aspects, I think whatever kind of anarchist tendency you're drawn to is going to depend a lot on temperament, just as much as anything else. And in a lot of ways, communism just suits me. That's not the only reason I'm a communist. That would be a poor reason by itself. But, you know, I'm not hostile to any other anarchist tendency, really, unless we're bringing in anarcho-capitalism. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, that I just 
Oh, go ahead. No, so I was just gonna say that's one of the reasons I I decided to to want to have a conversation with you because I mean one of the I, I was following this anarchist communist who was like who just tweeted something like market anarchism is a legitimate form of anarchism and I was just like my God like when's the last time you heard someone of an ideological tendency that's outside of yours say something positive about another that's you know <laughs> and I was just like my God I can I can like fuck with this dude I can we're gonna be able to like have dialogue very easily. I mean, that's really nice of you to say. But yeah, I'm not hostile really to any other anarchist tendency. I just, every one of them that I don't identify with has certain things to me that make me a little bit uneasy. I'm not saying that it's outright authoritarian. It's just not as like, not as libertarian as I would like it to be. Like something like collectivism, which begins by collectivizing property and then immediately reverses itself by having individual remuneration in a wage system. I'm not fond of that. Mutualism, you know, you have democratic, if we want to use that word, democratic workplaces, you know, competing in a non-capitalist market. But no matter how democratized or no matter how libertarian the workplace itself is, market forces, to me, in my opinion, aren't very libertarian. Okay. They're, I mean, you might be able to tell me some stuff about this, I don't know. But to me, they always seem impersonal, and if you want to use that word, sort of anti-democratic and in any market economy you're going to have to deal with that in some way or another and i'd just rather not have to deal with that yeah 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 well it's interesting because you can sort of reduce the definition of a market down to just trade right you can say swapping things sure but once once that sort of becomes institutionalized and then maybe a medium of exchange is formed then that starts to look like and I think people's fear and what you might fear is once that becomes institutionalized and normalized, you then serve the market in some way instead of just doing what it is that you want to do. Whereas what I see with market exchange, specifically with the uh, impersonal thing, that's actually a good thing to me in some ways that you wouldn't have to know everything about someone in order to engage with them in a way that meets your needs in some way. And to me, money in exchange sort of condenses that knowledge through a process that makes it more likely for you to have your needs met. And if that isn't how you want to engage with the world, it's totally fine. Mm -hmm. To me, the entire point of market anarchism is to have that available as an option. But as soon as it becomes all-encompassing where you have no other option but to engage in the cash nexus, then I think you're, what you were saying is like entirely fair, that it is then not so libertarian and becomes sort of this monolith of a way to interact with others. Because mm -hmm. if you can hunt and gather to survive, or if you can be self-sufficient to survive, why not be able to trade to survive? Sure. And like I said, I'm not hostile to that at all. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Well, I'm certainly not hostile to trade. Well, in a way, but <laughs> we might talk about that a little bit later. Sure. But no, it's. Uh, I think we pretty much agree here because the thing I'm concerned about is what you said, serving the market when it becomes institutionalized. That, that's when it, stuff like that really starts to get my dander up. All right. Well, what's your vision of a healthy anarchist society? How might it work? That's a great question. You know, I'm a big fan of Malatesta, and he sort of advocated a kind of wait-and-see approach. You know, he said, you know, any freely chosen stateless system, mutualist, collectivist, communist, syndicalist, whatever, I'm not opposed to any of that. I'm, I'm all for freedom of experimentation. I think there's going to be a lot of experimentation in any anarchist society, whatever that might mean. And so, you know, if it turns out that mutualism is more conducive to freedom, more conducive to equality than communism or collectivism or anything like that, I'd say, yeah, well, yeah, hurrah for mutualism. Sign me up. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I have my own ideas, and I'm, I'm not trying to oppose any other anarchist's ideas, really. I'm just trying to make my own clear, as clear as I can anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm just curious, like, what is the everyday life for you and your free society, you know? Um, I mean, I think you and I would agree that obviously it would be great to live without a boss or a, a landlord. See, these are like just simple things. But like, how do I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? You know, I'm not... Uh, <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that, but I wasn't ready for it yet. <laughs> So in a lot of ways, I think things won't change very much. And in a lot of other ways, I think they'll change so drastically that we might not be able to recognize them. Because, you know, not to use a cliche, but the best parts of our lives are anarchy already. Everything that you do on your own in your free time 
if it's actually free, you know, in a lot of ways, people today never actually stop working. But I don't think that's going to change very much. You know, I don't think, you know, getting together with friends for some drinks is going to change very much. Right. Assuming the coronavirus ever goes away. I don't think, you know, walking down the street. Well, that might change a little bit, depending on whether we have cars or not. But the cappuccino thing, I think there'd probably be a place where you can get coffee. It might not be a coffee shop anymore. It's certainly not going to be a Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, you would just go up and say, hey, I would like – I don't drink coffee, so what's your coffee order? I don't know. I might get coffee with, with like almond milk or something. Okay. So it's my day to be behind the coffee counter. You say – you come up to me and say, hey, give me a coffee with almond milk. I say, okay. I hand you the coffee and you walk away. A couple of days later, it might be your turn. Yeah, I think I see what you're saying. Sort of like rotating, like voluntary labor. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I, see, I, th- I think I see what you're saying. Like uh, Charles Fourier, the great French utopian, he uh, he envisioned people changing tasks once every two hours during a workday. I think that would get exhausting fairly quickly. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's really not very healthy for people, either for their body or for their mind, to do one small thing over and over again five days a week, six days a week, eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. So I think rotation of tasks is going to be an important thing. I I don't think we're going to have to give up anything we want if we want it bad enough. We might realize that a lot of things we think we want, we don't actually want bad enough. If I was a big coffee aficionado, but if I'm not willing to take a turn at the coffee shop, Mm -hmm. I might realize that I don't want to drink coffee as badly as I thought I did. (laughs) Yeah, totally. You and I are going to agree very strongly on the work thing. I mean, at minimum, work as we know it just just wouldn't exist without the state. Right. I mean, it just just wouldn't exist. And it just it is fucking soul crushing the amount of time and our short lives that we have to waste under the boss's thumb to serve something other than our own interests. Oh, absolutely. Have you seen the movie Office Space? I have. I, it's been a while. But yeah, I have. Well, there's a line from that movie that I, I'll say a lot to my coworkers. You know, we don't have a lot of time in this world. We're not meant to spend it this way. Yeah, that's good. That's that's very true. Another world is possible, and God damn it, man. We got to fucking try to build it because this shit ain't working, and it's not conducive to human flourishment. Oh, absolutely. So even though you prefer not to live in a way that is sort of market oriented does your vision of a free society allow for the freedom of people to experiment and trade market exchange absolutely because um i think that if it wasn't allowed it would uh, have to be forbidden in some way and to use the old uh, situationist slogan it's forbidden to forbid <laughs> yeah so no i'm not if i can quote one of my favorite anarchists uh, emile armand He said, I'm convinced there's room on this planet for every blossom in the libertarian rainbow. Mm -hmm. I would add a caveat that on the condition that there's no exploitation of others, sort of uh, Benjamin Tucker's law of equal liberty, which I wouldn't use that term, but just so I have a concise way of talking about it, that would be the one condition I would apply to that. So, you know, mutualist, collectivist, individualist, syndicalist, any type of economy that people want to try, I say let them try it. You know, it might have better or worse results. But uh, that'll be something we can learn from. There's going to be all kinds of experimentation. There's going to be a lot of different things that are tried. I think that eventually one or the other will come out on top, but maybe not. Yeah. Maybe there will always be different things being tried at the same time, which I wouldn't have a problem with that either. I think that was more or less Malatesta's view. Okay. I could see like a norm forming, um, but it's hard for me to think that uh, with that much experimentation that we wouldn't just see just possibilities expand exponentially because of the freedom that we would be given to do that experimentation. And your caveat of adding non-exploitation to the libertarian rainbow is sort of implied in the word libertarian, right? Well, you would think so. Right, but not always. (laughs) There are a lot of people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We're on the same page. (laughs) Yeah. For sure. So it seems like you're definitely somewhat sympathetic to um, anarchism without adjectives. Is that accurate to say? Yeah, definitely. I used to try to use that label. It just resulted in too much confusion, so I've pretty much abandoned it. But no, I think that's a great ideal for every anarchist to at least think about. I'm definitely sympathetic to it. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's definitely, it's a mouthful, too, if you're concerned with expending too much energy on what it is that you identify with. Anarchism without adjectives has a few more syllables than I think anyone could possibly tolerate. I've accepted it a long time ago that I'm never going to be able to be as concise as I'd like to be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, <laughs> moving, moving on a little bit. Yeah, I, w- I want to move into some questions I have about religion. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, you've written a bit on the subject. And I personally grew up religious and developed an interest in theology because of that. And I'm no longer religious, which I I don't know whether or not you are. Um, However, I always appreciated folks who explore the intersections of religion and politics as you do. Um, How did you become interested in that topic? Well, you said earlier we probably have a lot in common. and You pretty much just described how I came to be interested in religion. Because I grew up in a very religious family, and it's actually around the same time that I became interested in anarchism, I became interested in other religions, other theologies, and started to begin exploring that for myself. And, you know, I'm not religious myself any longer, but um, I'm still interested in it as something to study. I was a religious studies minor when I was in college, and so I've just kept up with it since then. Yeah. Speaking of, you wrote an article called All Prayer is Class Prayer. Uh, what was that all about? First of all, that wasn't my title, but I did write most of the article. Oh, okay. Just the clarification. But um, yeah, that was an article that me and a friend at Wither wrote about Appalachian religion in the first half, most mostly in the first half of the 19th century, and how it affected or didn't affect class struggle. Because um, the thing about Appalachia is that it's geographic isolation, relative geographic isolation has made it sort of a a hot spot for a lot of fringe religious groups that don't really exist anywhere else. And a lot of other places they've died out, but they still have a fairly strong presence in Appalachia. And we just wanted to kind of pick that apart, you know, how exactly did that play into Appalachian farmers, Appalachian miners, their daily lives, their working conditions, how they responded to class struggle. And uh, that's a pretty old article now. It came out about two years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was interesting about it to me is where you pointed out that people engage with Christianity in a cathartic way to sort of deal with whatever angst they may have, whether it be with work or sort of existentially or whatever. I don't know how you feel about this, but I've often felt that to convince, say, my grandmother out of Christianity would feel almost imperialistic. No, definitely. Uh, (laughs) I have similar feelings about my grandmother. Yeah. So... (laughs) I mean, I mean, I might edit this out, but I've never even told her that I'm not a Christian. Yeah, same. I mean, come on. You know, how are you going to do that? I mean, how are you going to... It's someone who honestly believes that hell is a place that you're going to exist for eternity. Right. If you don't believe in Christ. How are you going to How are you gonna put that on someone? I know. It's... it's <laughs> I would just feel like I just gunned down her dog. Right. <laughs> exactly. Like, <laughs> so... Uh, it seems that if we're rejecting Christianity and the Protestantism that I think we might have grown up with, then you have to reject the puritanical imperialism that comes with it also. Yeah. How do we promote freedom from Christianity without falling into militant evangelical atheism? I'm really not sure, because I think we've seen like an attempt of that a couple years ago when the new atheist movement was sort of at its peak, and obviously that ended badly. I don't think it necessarily had to, but, you know, now it's almost considered, if I can use the expression, it's almost considered unwoke to be an atheist now. You know, I think a lot of people had their fingers burned as far as criticism of religion is concerned by some of the excesses of the new atheist movement, stuff like, you know, anti-Muslim bigotry and people like Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, even Christopher Hitchens. Mm -hmm. And so I think that left a lot of people afraid to criticize religion at all which I have a lot of problems with. So how do we criticize Christianity without imperialistically dominating our grandmothers? (laughs) I think it's more of a both and than an either or. Like, you know, I can criticize Christianity. I don't have to say, well, you have to become non-religious. There are also, you know, there are Christian anarchists, there are radical Christians out there, progressive Christians that have a completely different set of ideas, and I think that's fine as far as it goes. But, you know, I think that the bad parts of Christianity don't have to be criticized because they're Christian, but because they're bad. Like, 
whether somebody is homophobic, I don't really care if they're doing it because they're quoting Leviticus or because they're just personally bigoted. Right. You're saying that it doesn't matter whether the homophobia was was secular in origin or religious. Like homophobia is homophobia and it should be combated if we're interested in living in a world without domination. Exactly. So on a related note, in Making of an Anarchist, Voltaire Declare wrote, Protestantism advocates that, quote, all forms of external authority must disappear to be replaced by self-control only. Is she correct in her observation of anarchism as a form of Protestantism? For some people, it's correct. I think the operative word there is external authority. Like famously, Max Stirner said that the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, was not actually a liberatory event because it ended the institutional domination of the formal clergy while it created an internal priesthood of all believers. So people have eliminated external authority only to internalize a form of authority that now resides within themselves and can be even more tyrannical than something that exists outside of yourself. Yeah, sort of internalizing the authoritarianism as opposed to outsourcing it. Yeah. It's not necessarily more liberatory. So she could be off base with that then. Again, I think it's true for some people. It was probably true for her. I think she she was a nun at some point, I believe. So I'm sure she saw Protestantism as more liberatory than I do. Right. Well, uh, you mentioned it earlier, but uh, with few notable exceptions, anarchists have historically been fairly hostile to religion. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on Christian anarchism or thinkers like Tolstoy? See, that's a, a really interesting question. Because when I first became an anarchist, I would have called myself a Tolstoyan. Because when I became interested in politics, out of my opposition to mountaintop removal, the Iraq war was at that time too, and I was extremely opposed to that. But I was sort of trying to gel my politics with my religious convictions, and so I decided that I would become a pacifist. And so for a while I believed that you know war was wrong on religious grounds. And so I'm still anti-war, but... Obviously, religion doesn't have anything to do with it any longer. But I was looking for something that would sort of gel with that, and I was listening to a lot of Utah Phillips at the time, folk musician, anarcho-pacifist, and somehow or another I got turned on to Tolstoy. And so for a while, probably from about 13, 15, 16, I would have described myself as a Tolstoyan. And Tolstoy was obviously a genius, but I sort of feel like he just kind of invented his own religion and then called that Christianity. If you read The Kingdom of God is Within You, it differs pretty strongly from any kind of Orthodox Christianity that I'm familiar with. Interesting. Moving on a little bit, you mentioned him earlier. You've written about Max Stirner, or Mox Stirner, at length. He's a character obviously hostile to religion in many ways. I want to ask you a few questions about him. Is there room for ethics within Stirner's philosophy? Yes, but it's going to be a really qualified yes. <laughs> Because, you know, obviously Stirner was one of the most notorious amoralist philosophers ever. But um, I do think there's an ethic there. There's clearly some kind of behavior he regarded as more positive than other kinds of behavior. You won't really find Stirner's ethic. Well, you'll find hints of it there, but it's not really fully explored in the unique in its property or the ego in its, in its own, as some people might call it. To really get a good sense of Stirner's ethic, I think you need to read one of his articles called The False Principle of Our Education, because it's there that Stirner talks about how an authoritarian, he says, whoever is a complete person has no need to become an authority. He says that by dominating other people, you're actually more dependent on them than they are on you. That someone who has to become unique by dominating others is just, his words are, the shoddy product of the people he's dominating. So a master is something created by slaves, but slaves aren't created by a master. And when he relates this to education, he says, you know, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but he says, I'm against the educator becoming an authority to the child, but also for the child becoming an authority over the educator. He says they can oppose their wills to one another, but not become authoritarian over each other. Interesting. Yeah, it, it seems to at least imply some sort of egalitarianism. Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, people have sort of a theme park idea of Max Stirner where, you know, egoism means you're going to run roughshod over other people. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's silly. Obviously, Stirner influences individualist anarchist thought in some ways. 
Why do you think so many on the left and other anarchists treat individualism as a dirty word? I think probably because it's become such a buzzword among conservatives. The whole bootstrap narrative, people interpret individualism as the social and economic laissez-faire, you know, each for himself, the devil take the hind one, that sort of thing. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's not individualistic behavior at all. It's... <laughs> It's a very kind of it's kind of a herd mentality because every other conservative agrees with that. But I don't know. I mean, I wonder more about this from anarchists than from Marxists because I can I can understand why, you know, a Marxist would be at least a little bit hostile to individualism. But with anarchists it's uh it's kind of something that I thought a lot about because I don't really see any good reason for them to be so hostile to it. I think some of it might also have to do with the sort of appropriation of individualist anarchism by the Libertarian Party. Back to Sterner a little bit. What evidence is there that Nietzsche, that Nietzsche's work was influenced by Sterner? Not very much. I mean, people who believe that Nietzsche was influenced by Sterner will tell you that there's a lot of it. It's all second or third hand accounts. Most of it's circumstantial. Nietzsche would have known of Sterner's book because he knew the history of materialism and the philosophy of the unconscious to books by Frederick Lang and uh, Edward von Hartmann, I believe. He knew those two books very well, and Stirner's book is mentioned in both. So he would have knew the name, he would have knew the title of the book. There's very little evidence that he ever read Stirner. He might have, but we just don't really know at this juncture. Like Nietzsche's favorite student at one point checked out the book from the library at the university he was studying at. And several of Nietzsche's friends and relatives have tried one way or another to say whether he was or not, but we just don't really know. As far as I'm concerned, he might have read Stirner, but um, I don't think Stirner was a big influence if he was an influence at all. And Deleuze says that, uh, that Nietzsche was influenced by Stirner, but in a negative way. Deleuze believes that Nietzsche was familiar with Stirner, but used him more of a springboard to distance himself from Hegelianism and stuff like that. So the real answer to that is we don't know. I'm more on the side of that Stirner was not an influence on Nietzsche, but other people have said other things. All right. So getting into some of the the meat of what it is that Stirner advocated, some people have beef with Stirner because of his emphasis on might makes right. It's easy to see this take as basically an underlying rationalization for fascism. Is this a fair critique? And what did Stirner actually mean by that? It might be a fair critique, depending on whether or not the person is asking it in good faith or bad faith, because I've had people do both. As far as the philosophical underpinnings of fascism, I think might makes right is just the underpinning of any form of organized government. It's a physical description, not a prescriptive or an ethical one. Stirner does say words to the effect of, one goes further with a handful of might than with a bag full of right. And obviously that can be a little bit disconcerting when you first read it, but he's stating a fact. He's not saying this is what people should do or it's just it's a description of how power works. Right, right. And he he didn't believe in rights. So obviously taking the might makes right literally is false. It's inaccurate. Yeah. Uh, So, yeah, he is just sort of describing a material condition then. Yeah. Well, people like Michel Foucault, they've said similar things. You know, Foucault is all about how power functions, and other people say it the same way when they say that history is written by the victors. Again, that's just a description of a fact. Right. It's not saying that history ought be written by the victors. Exactly. (laughs) All right. All right. So one other critique of Stirner that I'd like to uh, throw at you, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but this is what I've read. It seems that Stirner didn't have a very long life, and it seemed that It was quite stressful and maybe even tragic in some ways. What might this say about his philosophy? Should we judge the the tree by its fruit? Great question. Uh, For those who don't know, I'll just hit the bullet points. Stirner died when he was about 45 of an infected insect bite. In the time between publishing The Unique and Its Property, he had a variety of jobs and never stayed in any of them for very long because he was very deeply in debt. And to avoid his creditors, he had to move around a lot. Didn't always work. He was thrown into jail twice for failure to pay his debts and at one point had to advertise in the newspaper for a loan. And uh, yeah, that's not really a great success story. It's not 
a life full of romantic or idealistic adventures the way a lot of famous revolutionaries, a lot of famous anarchists have had. I'm not sure how much we can judge his philosophy based on that. How many people judge Nietzsche's philosophy on the fact that he went insane and spent the rest of his life in an asylum or something like that, you know? Other people have tried to draw the connection, you know, like John Henry McKay, he tried to point out that Stirner's philosophy had an ataraxic, almost Buddhist dimension to it, avoiding being dragged along by any of our appetites. And so he tried to justify Stirner's poverty and his unfortunate life by saying, no, it was just he was just living out a philosophy of non-attachment. I think that's pretty dubious. So I don't really know. His later years aren't as tragic as people often try to make them out to be. There's been some more research on that, but I can't really give you the details right here. It's mentioned in Enemies of Society, which I don't have my copy in front of me right now, but if anybody wants to look it up, I'm sure they can. But um, no, I don't think it's fair to judge Stirner's philosophy based on his life. Or if it is fair, it's only, to, it's only fair to do so to the extent that we do it to other philosophers. I think there's a conversation to be had there, but I don't think we can evaluate his philosophy strictly in biographical terms. Okay, so we don't normally take musical breaks on the podcast, but I thought it'd be cool to briefly showcase our guest's talent. So at this moment in the conversation, we took an opportunity to grab a beer and pour another glass of wine. Feel free to do the same if you'd like. Here's Maddie singing Freight Train by Elizabeth Cotton. Freight train, freight train, run so fast. Freight train, freight train, run so fast. Please don't tell them what train I'm on, so they won't know what route I'm gone. as well as any other time. <laughs> I heard there was like a blind study on people to taste test wine. They gave him like really expensive wine and like really cheap wine. And like the vast majority of people just couldn't tell the difference. No, I'm sure. 
I, I used to be a wino, but um, I started getting, I started to realize that it gave me migraines. Oh yeah. It was a trigger, so I had to stop, unfortunately. But wine is the best. We do have a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. All right. Well, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to move on to uh, the topic of music, if you don't mind. Sure. You wrote an article called Mountain Music, A Great Folk Scare. What was that all about? Yeah, that was another article for Wither I did. So one of the other people on the Wither editorial committee said, well, Matt, it would be cool, you know, if you wrote an article about the politics of folk music in Appalachia. And that's what I tried to do, because it's interesting that the folk music revival in the United States, which ran from about 1940 to 1965, was mostly associated with left wing politics, which is sort of an anomaly because in the rest of the world, folk music revivals tend to be associated with revivals of nationalism and consequently with right-wing politics. And so this was an article that just sort of traced exactly what made the American folk revival different from other folk revivals, how leftist politics, well, you know, leftist politics, communist politics, whatever you want to call it, became incorporated into the urban folk revival, mostly associated with the 60s. And then I tried to examine like sort of how distant in a way the urban folk scene was from the material that was its source because a lot of the songs that were sort of popular during the, uh, the urban folk revival in the 1960s and the 1950s, all the way back to the forties in a way were coming from Appalachia. You know, it was mountain music in the literal sense of the word, but a lot of people were just sort of, a lot of the people who were singing that and made it a commercial success were pretty distant from the people who were actually first associated with this kind of music and i wanted to explore that a little bit okay and uh what's your what's your personal relationship with music and um how does it intersect with your politics well i started playing music seriously when i was about 12 you know my dad plays my grandmother played so it was always around but i just never took the time to take the serious dedication to it until i was about 12 and the strange thing about that was, you know, I didn't start playing American folk music. I started off playing Irish traditional music because um, a friend of mine in high school heard the song Whiskey in the Jar. And I don't know if he was hearing the Metallica version or the Thin Lizzy version or any of the other like rock and roll versions. But eventually he stumbled, stumbled across the recording by the Dubliners. And he said, well, here, Matt, listen to this. And I, <laughs> this sounds really cliched, but I'd never heard anything like that. And so I stole a mandolin from my dad and decided I had to learn how to play that kind of music. And later on, uh, I sort of uh, realized that I didn't have the right accent to sing <laughs> Irish songs. <laughs> That's not the real reason, but I, be I became more interested in, uh, you know, American folk music, music from my own cultural tradition. And uh, I've been playing ever since. As far as politics goes, I'm going to quote Pat the Bunny, if that's okay. In one of his songs, he says, oh, well, a punk rock song won't change the world, but I can tell you a few that have changed me. And that's sort of the relationship to folk music and politics I have. I know that a folk song, you know, is obviously never going to change the world, but there are quite a few that have changed me, as corny as that sounds to say, because I would have never really become, I wouldn't have probably even known what communism was if it wasn't for people like Pete Seeger or people like Woody Guthrie. And, you know, as as I started to explore American folk music, I got turned on to Pete Seeger and back from Pete Seeger, people like Lead Belly, people like uh, Woody Guthrie, they all sang these labor songs and all these political songs. And a lot of people can just listen to those songs. But for some reason, that didn't happen to me. So listening to the songs, I started trying to get more information about the politics they were connected to. And that's sort of what led me on the winding path to anarchism. That's really interesting. That's great, actually. You always hear of people coming to anarchism from punk music or something, but not so frequently do you hear people arriving at it from uh, folk music. So that's that's kind of cool to hear. In an article you wrote, you described folk music as more of a process than a genre. Can you explain what that means? Sure. So folk music is a process and not a genre in the sense that folk is an umbrella term that encompasses many, many genres. Like, you know, there's folk blues, there's folk, you know, stuff like mountain music, there's polka, some polka is folk music. Not that I'm really that interested in polka, but it's impossible to really sit down and just write a folk song. A folk song is something that somebody must have wrote at one time, but sort of becomes a sort of handed down thing. 
So somebody could have made up a song a long time ago, you know, however long ago that was. And it's been handed down so many times. And of course, each time the song gets handed down, it changes a little bit. And so the form that we have it in now might be completely different than the form it existed in when it was first made up. And that's the folk process. So new songs come from old ones. Old ones change a little bit every time people sing them. And that's what makes folk more of a process than a genre, you know. For sure, yeah. How has folk music interacted with politics historically? It's a good question. I don't really know much about how folk music has interacted with politics in the rest of the world. In the United States and the UK, like I said, it mostly was associated with uh, left-wing politics during the uh, so-called urban folk revival which, you know, from the mid, mid-40s mid to the mid-60s. And you had people like Ewan McColl, who was pretty much the, if we want to use this expression, high priest of folk music in the UK, who was a very outspoken socialist. And you had people like Pete Seeger, who, you know, was put on trial for contempt of Congress for communist activities. And so that's mostly where I interact with how folk music is intersected with politics. Like I mentioned before, from what I understand, in the majority of the world, folk revivals are usually associated with revivals of nationalism. That would be another way that folk music interacts with politics. But I don't know as much about it as I should know or would like to know. Yeah. You kind of touched on this earlier also, but what role can folk music or music more broadly play in expanding freedom? That's a really good question. I'm not exactly sure that it can other than on like a personal level like i said before you know there are no songs that are going to change the world but there are a few that have changed me and so one way i think is people can address issues because the first time i'd ever heard about you know emmett till you know the murder of emmett till was in a bob dylan song and obviously you know later on i learned the whole history of that or you know when i first heard about the iww i never would have heard about the iww if it hadn't been for the various iww songs that are still really popular so that's one way you know people can address issues i will say that political songs are really tough to write because there's a difference between creating a valid musical experience and well-intentioned pamphleteering people don't like to be preached to so it can be difficult to write a good political song Obviously, there are differences in approach. Like, if you're writing a song for people to sing together at a rally, it doesn't have to be a piece of poetic genius. There's a big difference between uh, dump the bosses off your back and how many miles must a white dove sail before she can sleep in the sand. It's difficult to talk about music in a way that's not cliched or even a little bit corny, but music does bring people together. It's obviously a great feeling when you're marching down the street and you start the chorus of Solidarity Forever and everybody joins in. You know, that's a great unifying feeling. And I think that's another way that it can expand freedom. There's also a lot to be said just for how much just creating something, how much that expands freedom on a personal level. You know, Utah Phillips, who I mentioned earlier, he said on one of his shows, he said, in a post-industrial mass marketing economy, a revolutionary song is any song you choose to sing yourself. Damn. Which that's a big thing that I'm about. Like my Twitter bio says folk music evangelist. And I really, that's obviously a bit of a joke, but I really do wish more people would realize that they could make music themselves instead of pushing a button and relying on other people to make it for them. Obviously, I'm not against that. It's just, obviously, it's a lot of fun to do that for yourself. Right, right. It's a, it's good therapy, too. Absolutely. Um, well, it's something I, I want to move on to now is the topic of tactics. We normally cover such topics on the podcast and not to beat a dead horse, but something that you and I have uh, affinity with also is sort of our, our hostility to voting. I mean, you'd think that an anti-voting position would be canon amongst anarchists, but it seems unfortunately that that's not always the case. Yeah, especially recently. Yeah, it's, it's very strange. Uh, Why do you oppose voting, and why do so many so-called anarchists think that it's a good tactic? There are a lot of reasons that I oppose voting. Just (laughs) to get the most obvious out of the way first, it doesn't work. (laughs) They always say, you know, the lesser of two evils. This is going to get us closer to where we want to go than where we were before. I can't really see how that's really ever happened. But more importantly, I think that voting implies the transfer of one's will to another person. I think that anarchism, in a fundamental way, sort of rejects the entire principle of representation. And so just on principled grounds, I would have to 
I would have to reject voting because even if voting could have some liberatory effects, I think, again, other people might question this because I would have thought that anti-electoralism was a core anarchist principle, but I think a core anarchist principle is the importance of self-liberation and any kind of change, for better or for worse, made through voting is going to fly directly in the face of that. And just to go back to the first thing for a little bit, it just doesn't work. I mean, voting can literally take hours in some places. You stand in line for that long and, you know, only to be turned away for some arbitrary reason. And so, like you said, I would have thought this was sort of an article of faith for anarchists of every stripe. Like I said, especially recently, that doesn't seem to be the case. And a lot of people have gotten really angry with me over that. Yeah, yeah, it, it, that's no surprise to me that people would get angry over. It. I wonder the extent to which this sort of sort of faith in voting that some anarchists seem to have is a product of bread tube, you know? It could be a lot of a lot of the more unsavory parts of the anarchist movement now are linked to bread tube. I also think that a lot of the newer anarchists were radicalized during or immediately after the 2016 election. I would say a lot of them are still very much more leftist than anarchist. I think that's the case for most of the anarchists in the DSA, for example. And so I think that influence is going to take a while to wear off. I hope it wears off. But uh, in the meantime, it's a very, very frustrating thing. Another interesting thing about the way you choose to frame your politics and what people normally would associate with those politics is that you are actually somewhat hostile to democracy. What's wrong with democracy? Yeah, I am a little bit hostile t to democracy, and uh, <laughs> that kind of scares a lot of people because the way political discourse is framed, especially mainstream political discourse, is that if you're hostile to democracy, then you support tyranny. Whereas I don't, I obviously don't support tyranny. I don't support democracy either. I support anarchy. And uh, the biggest thing that's wrong with democracy is that democracy is a form of government. And as an anarchist, I want to eliminate all forms of government. And I can uh, try to explain a little bit more what that means. So people like David Graeber or people like Noam Chomsky, who is the biggest anarcho-democrat out there, they tend to frame democracy as something that, that any form of egalitarian participatory management of society is democracy. Graeber, for instance, he says, oh, well, there were a lot more a lot of other societies that had democracy rather than ancient Greece, where ancient Athens, where democracy is widely credited with having been invented. So why don't we include them in the democratic tradition? I would like to problematize that and say that, yeah, there are more inclusive, more egalitarian, more participatory ways of running society. But I think it makes more sense to say, OK, well, democracy have, has fallen short of all these other ways of participatorily running a society, rather than cram them into the democratic tradition, I think it would make more sense to respect and honor them in their own terms where we can. Yeah, I, I, I feel you there. And there are, other, there are other critiques of democracy besides that, because democracy certainly needs a critique. Not all the critiques, in my opinion, are equally valid. <laughs> you know, there are some who critique democracy on the grounds that democracy is rooted in the idea of the public as a writhing mass that needs to be controlled. That was pretty much Bordiga's view. So does that mean you favor consensus as a decision-making process instead? Not always. I should have touched on this earlier, but when we talked about being anti-voting, I'm not anti-voting as in the pure act of voting. You know, if, if my roommates and I were trying to decide what we wanted on a pizza and we put it to a vote, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to that. I'm anti-parliamentary, anti-electoral. So, you know, in... Some methods of anarchist decision making might rely on voting, just purely, you know, as a way of making decisions known. Other times, consensus might be the way to go. Other times, you know, I think some people have talked about selecting a person who will make the decision by lottery. I think anything could be tried. Consensus, I think, is the ideal. Obviously, it can't always be implemented. I think that's less of an obstacle than people think it is. I think a lot of times it can be implemented where people say that it can't. So really, I'm against any kind of institutionalized, one-size-fits-all form of decision-making. So I think any kind of variation that people want to try, as long as it is genuinely egalitarian and is genuinely voluntary, I think that might be okay. Right, right. So in, in that case, it seems like we could leave room then for sort of a 
I don't know if this is the best way of framing it, but like a micro majoritarianism, as long as the individuals interacting with that scheme have the ability, a meaningful ability to exit. Yeah, absolutely. Malatesta talks about this. Obviously, in many cases, there's going to be a majority and a, minor- and a minority. So one way to do it is majoritarianism. One, one way to do it is taking turns. Obviously, you know, anarchists don't favor the minority oppressing the majority. They also don't favor the majority oppressing the minority. There's a difference between oppression and just obstinacy. Like any kind of social living requires some form of concessions from the participants. And so I think there's going to be a lot of taking turns. There's going to be a lot of figuring out how this is going to work. I think it can work as long as, you know, libertarian principles are upheld. Hell yeah, man. All right. So how do we expand freedom without electoralism or at a minimum uh, institutional support from the legal system? There's a lot of different ways. I'm really in favor of like stuff like strikes, stuff like boycotts, you know, direct action at the point of production. Well, we're seeing <laughs> – actually, I should say this. We're seeing uh, in the streets every day and on the news every day a lot of great ways of how to expand freedom without relying on electoralism or uh, support from the legal system. I'm not saying that everybody should immediately go down and go out and burn down their police station. <laughs> but uh, if they do, I won't be sorry about it. <laughs> The last word, as far as that goes, is direct action, and there are all kinds of ways that can be interpreted, but that's, uh, that's, my, that's my answer. <laughs> all right, so towards the end of these interviews, I like to do a lightning round where I list a series of people or ideas and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? Yeah, let's do it. All right, first one on the list is organizationalism. Yeah, um... Putting the cart before the horse. Please expand. Okay. <laughs> not sure if I can in one minute, but yeah, organizationalism is sort of, I'm not against organization. A lot of people think I am. I'm for organization, mostly temporary organizations for a specific purpose. But a lot of people seem to have the idea that you're going to create an organization and then decide what it's going to do. It's a solution looking for a problem. Okay. All right. Primitivism. Primitivism is something I'm really interested in because mostly just because I've never seen anything quite so divisive. A lot of people are really into it. A lot of people absolutely hate it. I'm sort of in the middle because I think the critique is good in a lot of ways, but I'm not sure about the solutions. Communization. Communization. Yeah, that's been a buzzword in the last couple of years, and it's usually linked to groups like Takoon and EndNotes. They both have their strengths and weaknesses, but as for me, I just think communization, I prefer to think of it as the actual process of enacting communism. You could almost make it a synonym of expropriation. A word that we've both used multiple times in this interview so far, libertarianism. Libertarianism for me has always just meant the opposite of authoritarianism, which admittedly isn't that useful. I've shied away from it in recent years because a lot of people, again, associate it with the Libertarian Party. I wish we could take it back. I think it's going to take a while. All right. Aragorn. Uh, yeah, rest in peace. He was, he was a really nice guy. I didn't know him well. We talked every now and again, and he published that review of uh, Jacob Blumenfeld's book on Sterner in The Anvil. Every time we talked, he was really, really nice, which was surprising to me because he had a very prickly reputation, but I miss him a lot. Yeah. The Grateful Dead. The bane of my existence for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is more of an issue when I was still performing, which is obviously on hold due to the coronavirus and when I was busking especially because – that was a lot of people's only reference point for old time music. And I'd be playing all these folky songs and it never failed. Someone would ask me, do you know any dead? <laughs> and the only grateful, de- the only grateful dead song I know is friend of the devil. And anytime I played it, they'd be like, Oh, that's so overplayed. And I'm like, what do you people want? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. In Texas, the go-to always seems to be something like, uh, y'all know any Skinner? Ugh. <laughs> it's even worse man alive alright so moving towards the end of our conversation here Maddie, 
Uh, what's your advice to others for creating a better anarchist culture? I'm not sure that I have any, but I'll try. So I think one way to do it is to uh, try to engage with ideas that you don't agree with. Not necessarily so you'll agree with them, but just because it'll give you a better understanding of what they are. Like we talked about, you comment on how unusual it is for a communist to not just blanketly condemn market anarchism. I think a lot of that is because people have no idea what exactly they're talking about. That sounds more dismissive than I intended it to. That's not what I meant, but a lot of people, just from discussions I've had, you know, a lot of people are talking about these things without really learning about them first. And that kind of behavior has always sort of alarmed me. I'm not sure I really have anything else. If you had one beef to pick with other anarchists, what would it be? What do you think they should do differently? Stop voting. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was reading a pamphlet by Wolfie the other day, and he has this whole, it was an article called uh, Anarchist Realism. And he talks about how so many anarchists are willing to vote, how many of them are willing to petition the government, how, how many of them are willing to engage with politicians going off the idea that a revolution isn't going to happen anytime soon and we have to uh, do what we can to make sure the lesser evil is there every time. And I, I'm very I'm very hostile to that kind of thing because I think taken seriously, that kind of just undermines any sort of radical action you might take whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So less, less of that, that's what I would like. All right. Where should folks go to follow you or support your work? They can follow me on Twitter at Reverend underscore Banjo. They can also occasionally see articles from me at Wither Appalachia, which we have a Facebook page, and I think we still have the blog up, which I think is just witherappalachia.blogspot.com. If not, you can just Google Wither Appalachia, and I'm sure it'll come up. Yeah. All right. Well, is there um, absolutely anything I forgot to ask you that you'd like to touch on before we end the interview? I would just like to say that I'm primarily a writer, not a talker. And so I hope uh, people bear with me as I stumble through my responses on this podcast. No, you sounded great. You sounded absolutely great. And I, I, I can't thank you enough for joining me, Maddie. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. I had a great time. Yeah, you got it. Well, uh, thanks so much, Maddie, for joining me today again. And uh, I hope you have a good rest of your day. And hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Talk to you later. All right. Bye. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed my interview with Maddie. If you like this episode and want to see this project continue, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash nonserviumedia. And if you can't pitch in financially, help us reach a larger audience simply by liking and sharing this episode. Finally, be sure to keep an eye out for next month's episode, and remember to follow us on Twitter and YouTube. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.